Well, we've gone from uh, in a few short weeks saying, when's the summer going to start? I need my raincoat. What's going on to um, what factor do I need for my uh, solar panel on my head? (laughs) Ah, here we are. A few thoughts about the music of late before we start. The music for the show, that is. Emily Renier, who's a a very important friend of the show, recently sent her piano practice session. (laughs) And by the magic of podcasting, even though we're out in the, uh, the open here, not a piano in sight. Hey, presto. Recognise this? Seems Emily likes the theme tune, but she's uh, she's not alone. It's uh, unusual to start with a male. We usually sort of tell you where we are. Well, I can tell you where I am. I'm, I'm in Berkshire, back in Berkshire this week. Wonderful being uh, in a different part of the world last week, wasn't it? But I'm going to start with a male. I'm going to start with Drew Leach in Yorkshire, I presume. Neil, I've been listening to the show now since Christmas, and without a doubt, the Friday photo walk has become part of my, my weekly habit, especially walking in Langthrasdale, which we're, we're very lucky to live close by to. This is uh, certainly a place you'd like to walk, a, a winding river. I looked up, it's the River Wharf, isn't it? I had to look that one up. This is what the Dales are all about, says Drew. Breathtaking, beautiful, any time of the year, even in the rain. But I've got a question for you. How brave are you? As we have a potholing community not so far away. And I think I would add a very different edge to one of your walks if you were to come with me on a potholing expedition. Just started myself three years ago and the exhilaration is something I find very hard to match. But the reason for the mail is also to say that the photo walk theme has become my sort of very welcome earworm each week. There's a, a sense of anticipation with those first notes. Is it available to buy? Well, um, well, no, Drew, it's not, sadly not, but uh, it is on Artlist, who provide all our wonderful, wonderful tracks that we use during the show. But uh, as for potholing, well, that sends proper shivers down my spine. Number one, I'm, I'm frightened I'd get wedged and somebody would need to extricate me like, uh, like those cartoons where you see larger-than-life characters being fire through uh, through tiny openings, you know, pushed out, boof, they fire out, don't they? Like a cork out of a bottle. But um, I'll admit I was, I was quietly intrigued, though, until uh, I did a little YouTube digging and came across a, a caver called Keith Edwards. Now, Keith's an English lad. I, wa- I watched for a minute 23, just one of his films, um, the moment in the film where he squeezed through this tiny hole way underground in a complex called The Vice and ended up in a tiny passage which had running water which he crawled along on his belly wondering if he'd be able to turn around to get back through and I thought that does not look like a hobby for me and the first thing that really went through my mind was what if it rains today anyway Drew you have to send us some pictures of your experiences I'll be pleased to see those, but uh, safe to say, I think I'm more of a photo walker than a a photo potholer. I'm sure that's... uh, I mean, we have a niche within a niche, but (laughs) that is a niche. But I tell you what, here, have these opening notes for nothing of the theme song. Photography Daily, the Friday photo walk. It's the Mailbag Photography Show, the Friday photo walk. Although you don't have to be a pro, a landscape or brilliant editorial photographer or any other kind of full or part-timer, or indeed exceptionally good hobbyist who makes the, the most extraordinary pictures, you can be somebody who just likes to make or take a picture or three with your smartphone. It's not a technical show, it's more about the feeling of photography and a chance to share some ideas, some projects and also to play you some inspirational words from past guests. Today we're back to chatting about photographing in abandoned places and one of our listeners has been exploring the kind of building that has a a foreboding history, past and present. I'm going to challenge you again at some point in the show to the first thing that you see to make a picture at that moment. We hear about photographers who've really embraced conservation, wind farms, and on that note, wind of a different nature, which I'm trying to be grown up about. We're off to Jutland and revisiting thoughts of Tibet, talk landscape and bird photography and hear from former guests Tom Stoddart with a fascinating story about how to smuggle pictures in a war zone. Barry Butler, who photographs every dawn and every Chicago sunset 
and George Logan, based for much of his time out of pandemic in Africa. The show is brought to you by the most amazing team of people, a community who invest what they feel is right for them. From as modest as £3 a month, the superheroes who keep a show afloat, as there is no large broadcast network here, though we're thankful also for the support from mpb.com, who help you buy, sell and trade used camera gear in the US, the UK and Europe. And you'll hear one of our writers today has a a good story about using mpb.com for a, a complete kit swap. Right, shall we walk? Make sure those laces are tight. We're walking at a pace for the first part of this for some reason. Camera's ready. Let's go. Lots of gates today. I'm not sure that I actually told you where I was. I got a bit lost, I think, with the uh, the potholing concerns. But uh, today I'm in, uh, well, it's Boxford stroke Winterbourne, which are two beautiful villages close to where I live. They're very much, uh, well, they're very... They're certainly very candy box. Isn't that the expression for them? Chocolate box. Thatched cottages. Oh, beautiful. Actually, a guy I was working with doing some photography uh, with his... Um, he's a, a sports therapist, and his, uh, his brother spent, I think, four or five years learning to be a master thatcher. Practically writes his own checks now. It's a wonderful... Uh, Wonderful occupation to be in. Well, in the UK, at any rate. In these beautiful um, candy box, chocolate box villages, at any rate. So, where shall we start? Um, I haven't made my first picture of the day yet. I've been walking and talking. I haven't actually made a picture. I feel I should, I feel I should make one before we start. Let's uh, just get a picture. This is a sort of open... It's just a, an open meadow, really. Nothing in particular, something and nothing, but worth getting a picture of. Here we go. Now, I don't have my pocket. I've got my manual focus camera and trying to do... Well, regular listeners to the show will know about the the famous pocket that I pop you in when I'm making pictures so that I can still talk. But with a manual camera, trying to um, focus and set everything because I'm using the X-Pro1, the Fujifilm X-Pro1 with a, a vintage lens... The 28 mil, but I have some news in a moment which I'll share, which may mean I'm not using this one next week. I'm going to still use it, but maybe not so much. But let me just get a picture of this meadow. Hold on. So what have we got? We've got uh, ISO 200. You knew that because we had a conversation about that last week. 500th is quite bright. I'm at uh, F8. And uh, there we go. First shot of the day. I feel I can. Uh, I feel I can go on now. Let's start with um, something about urbex, shall we? Urban exploration. I tell you what, I'm pleased I wore my long trousers today, even though it's boiling hot, and I've got these black walking trousers on. Walking through long grass and and nettles and and creepy crawlies probably wouldn't be wise for a short day out, would it? Um, urbex, yes, gem. Jan Eric Mosterum wrote in urbex do i need to explain it we talked about it last week didn't we urban exploration where you go into to buildings that are that were once occupied tumble down buildings that kind of thing takes a bit takes a bit of um takes a few kahunas to do so when you look at some of these places that people go into but it is a it's a fascinating uh, hobby and pastime and I, i must admit i'm I'm getting more and more interested. Well, we're going to have some guests on the show for sure, but more and more interested to do a little bit myself. Uh, oh, look. Before we go a step further, I've spotted where the track goes beautifully, sort of, it's into shade. And then the other side of the shade, there's, um, it's bathed in sunshine, so you get this beautiful vignetting. I'll tell you what, let me take a picture and you'll understand it better. No pocket. <laughs> Let me balance you for a second while I try and get this picture. See, setting the, setting the ISO and aperture and everything, that's not really the problem. It's the, uh, it's the manual focusing. I'm kind of turning it. Not sure if you can hear. I'm, I'm uh, turning the focus while I'm, while I'm talking to you. There you go. Another one of those. I think that 
That looks broadly in focus. Don't worry, Neil, if it isn't, what do we say? It's art. So, uh, yeah, from Jem. We will get there in a, in a moment, Jem. Jan-Eric Mostrom, thank you very much for your, your mail. You asked for suggestions for people who do urban exploration. So here's a couple on Twitter that I follow. Abandon America and TID photography. Does TID stand for something in the, in the urbex community? I'm not quite sure. Anyway, contacted, done. I, uh, I wrote to them immediately and um, I've invited them to come and have a chat, uh, chat about the, the work that they do. There's some extraordinary pictures that they, that they make on their urban explorations. I was uh, particularly engrossed in Abandoned America's work. Uh, but I found an additional one, actually. So I think, Jem, you're into it, aren't you? So um, there, there's some superb work on this one. Different continent, too. Tanja and Kimo, they're a partnership, and I'll link to their website, which is uh, abandonednordic.com. And I went to their, um, their bio page, and I read uh, a bit about them. We do recognise the fact that the abandoned buildings might belong to someone. Private property, in other words. If we enter an abandoned building, we never break any locks or windows, nor do we tear down boards from windows. We only walk if the door is open. We only walk in if the door is open. Usually, we have the permission of the owner. If we enter a building, we never take anything else with us than photographs. Uh, we don't take any items or souvenirs away from the places. We're not vandals. We don't spray or break anything. We want to honor the original. If your private property is seen in our photos, take it as a compliment and you know when you when you see the state that some of these places are in what people have done to them because they think well nobody lives there anymore i can do what i like to it you uh you understand that that's uh, well that's respect so uh i dropped uh, chandra and kimo a mail because i thought definitely i'd like to talk to you about your work it's extraordinary work and let's stay on this theme shall we with uh, Matthias Fox somewhere in Germany. And uh, he's staying with this theme, continuing with this theme of, uh, of abandoned buildings. Uh, the Urbex, urban exploration. Uh, I'm gonna put his pictures up on the show page today. Sorry if I'm out of breath a bit, but I've just been, <laughs> I've just realized, looking back along the track where I've walked, oh, I've walked right up, uh, I've walked right up here. Now I've had my, I've, I've, I've had the continuation of my journey stopped by two things. A horrible helicopter about to fly over, overhead. And uh, some horses have stood right against the gate. Are you going to let me in? You're not, are you? You're not going to let me in. They're, they're big old horses. Look at you. I'm certainly not arguing with you. Should we let that helicopter go over? There we go. Power 109, if I'm not much mistaken, or if I'm not mistaken. Um, where were we? Yes, talking about Matthias Fox with, uh, I, can't, I can't go any further, the horses have blocked my way. Let me, let me through in a moment, chaps, would you? Don't think so. I think we're quite happy here doing our car impressions. Yeah, I think you are. I'm not gonna argue with you. Hello, Neil. Hope all is well on your side. I'm listening to your podcast since the, the beginning. I heard you asking for some images for your Friday photo walks. My favourite part of the week. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Hopefully, I'm not going to overwhelm you with the images attached. I chose three different sets, one in each mail. Actually, Matthias, what I'm going to do is uh, use one set today, the set about the urban exploration, since that makes sense. And I'm going to save the other two for some future episodes in the coming weeks and months. So thank you for them. The first set, he says, is from a real lost place, a former lung clinic and a proper location to feel uncomfortable. The hospital was built uh, after World War I to treat soldiers exposed to poisonous gas and later to heal patients suffering from tuberculosis. In World War II, it was also used to treat evacuated, injured kids from nearby cities. A British bomber hit by German anti-aircraft artillery had to drop its bombs early and sadly, um, it hit the children's ward of the hospital, killing nearly 40 young patients. My word, what a history. 
It was rebuilt after the war and went on to continue treating patients with lung problems until the last owner went bankrupt in 2006. This makes for a proper chilly location, don't you agree? Sadly, there's a lot of vandalism and some uh, Satanists were roaming there, so uh, shooting at this location with doors clapping in the wind was, uh, was kind of exciting. Oh, I'm not sure I'd put the word exciting to it. Chilling, worrying, concerning, all those kind of words, yeah. Here are some shots from within the building, as, uh, as it was, more or less accessible then. Today, everything's sealed off and guarded. Yes, I saw some dates on the wall of, uh, of one of your pictures, and it does look like these, these are ones you made a, a while back that are from your catalogue. They're cracking pictures, though. Nerves of steel, Matthias. Nerves of steel. I mean, the place is very eerie that you sent in, and the, the children's ward story is enough to send shivers again. It really is. And I can see too by the, the digital grain here and there in the darker photographs that you're, you're photographing by available light. And there's, uh, there's not always a lot of that. Did you go alone? Whew. And that, that Satanist scene um, picture that looks like, I don't know, it looks like you made it in, in a, in a treatment, it looks like it was a treatment room. I mean, that is not a bunch I'd have wanted to run into. Sorry, chaps. <laughs> Didn't mean to interrupt. I appear to be lost. I was looking for the local train station, um, uh, pub. Um, anyway, I'll be off. Don't feel you need to show me the way. Carry on with what you were doing. God, dear. I wouldn't have wanted to wander into that. And then to top all this, you find what looks like some kind of patient card or something. I think you were on the, you were on the roof, weren't you, of the building? Did you say fifth floor? Uh, anyway, this, this patient card looks like it could be between 1942 and 1945. Wow, I mean, that's... That place is full of history. Some of it very dark, obviously, yes. But I'll, I'll pop those pictures on the show page today. And thank you also to Jem for sending in uh, some suggestions of uh, those that we could talk to for, um, for an interview about urban exploration. And uh, I'm serious. I'm looking forward to going to do some walks with some, some urbex, some urban explorers. In fact, there was one suggestion sent in. It was kind of a... It was, it was kind of a... Um... Did you hear that, by the way? <laughs> I'm not sure you heard that. <laughs> One of the horses that is the other side of the, uh, of the fence. You'll just have to believe me. They've all got their backsides turned to me. Let me get a picture. And they're passing wind. Hold on. All right, let me focus. 500th, what are we at? F56 now. And, uh, yeah, 500th. There we go, another one of those. Thanks very much. But as I was about to say, yes, one of those, one of those is gonna be a location, a, an actual maritime location, urbex shoot, if we can work it out. We were trying to do it over the summer, but it looks like we may have to take to the seas. Sounds like a pirate story, Neil, in, uh, in September, possibly October, actually. I'm looking forward to that. Urban exploration. If you know of anybody that you particularly follow, still, uh, still send it in. I'd, I'd be fascinated to look at it. And we'll put the show in the show notes today. We'll put the links that I've uh, I've talked about with those uh, super explorers. See, you couldn't have planned this. Well, maybe you could, but there's a there's kind of a scene of urban exploration here. There's a. It's a corrugated tin building. I think it's actually stable, so it's not as not quite as exciting. Shall I get a picture of it? Uh, well maybe it's it's just a tin hut, Neil. Move on. I don't know. Kind of work with a story I was sharing with you from uh, Matthias a moment ago. Shall we go for our first thing that you see picture? Yes. This has uh, actually ended up being quite um, <laughs> quite a popular part of the programme. Thank you very much for for all taking part in it. Uh, there's, uh, there's quite a few in the, uh, the inbox now, and um, I'm going to feature a few uh, in a moment. I'll tell you about a few in a moment, but uh, then I, I, I will over the coming weeks. If you've sent one in and it doesn't get featured this week, fear not, it will be. But uh, first thing that you see, feature. It's, um, it's all about uh, just stopping for a moment and taking a picture at the, at, the, at the given moment, the moment that I see right, take a picture now, that's when you, take your, that's when you make your picture. So in essence, grab, your, uh, grab whatever camera you're using. It's very busy today in the skies, isn't it? You're a noisy lot. Helicopters, aircraft. 
If there was only one benefit, there wasn't really any benefits at all, but one sort of uh, nice-ish, and I'm even pausing at that word, during the, the time of lockdown, was that we had absolute silence in the skies for some of the, some of the walks that we did. Um, yeah, the idea of the first thing that you see is um, grab your camera, could be a camera, could be a, an iPhone, a smartphone, anything, whatever you make pictures on, whatever's closest to you now. What's that expression? The best camera's the one, yes, that's it. The best camera's the one you have in your hand at the time, isn't it? Yes, that's the expression. So grab your picture-making apparatus and, um, and what we do is we, we make a picture, you send it in to uh, studio at photographydaily.show, studio at photographydaily.show, and uh, we'll put them up. And it's fascinating to know where you're, where you're actually listening to the show. So uh, I don't really have a lot around me, but um, the idea is that we just make a picture. So here we go. Lift the camera. Breathe. There we go. Take a breath. And then click. First thing that you see. Perfect. Now take that picture. Send that in. I'm fascinated to know where, where it is that you're you're listening to this here program. Uh, what have we got from, uh, from the last couple of weeks anyway? Mike Miller's Incredible Sunset. So you'll see these on the, the show page today. Mike Miller's Incredible Sunset, a view to be insanely envious of. It really is. When you see it, you'll, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Early and Lillibo, uh, a little snap of the first thing I saw while listening to this week's photo walk. Always keep a camera with me at work. Action shot of a colleague in a forklift truck, or forklift rather, loading a truck. And uh, I think it was taken on your X100V. Oh, that was my news I meant to tell you. Yes. Next week, I'm bringing out the X100V. Duh! I got one. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't resist any longer. Little opportunity came up. And when those little opportunities come up, they shout, this is the moment. You say, oh, all right then. Okay. Um, Elliot Thomas view from his car pulled over of um, and, and it's sort of green fields for just as lot as far as you can see no horizon just green fields. Eric Delorme the snaking path beautiful before uh, before you in the park as you were walking through the park the other day. Dionysi Lichnos is in his bathroom. Ah, oh, it's a shower scene. There had to be one. Grumpy old man with a camera, aka Dave from his uh, truck en route to New Hampshire. In his 18-wheeler. Oh, that's impressive. 10 to 14 hours of podcast per day. Dave, that's like a marathon. I tell you, I, I'm going to give you a little... Um, I'm going to give you a... Here we go. Never mind your camera, because you can't use it while you're driving, I know. Um, I don't know how you got that photo. It was automatic, Neil. Ah, oh, yes, of course it was. Um, but um, here's something you can do. I want you to do what only 18-wheeler truckers can do. Pull that chain or press that button give me a loud a really loud blast of that two three four five six tone whatever it is go on go on dave do it now now see there we go show me we weren't able to experience that moment with you but i'm, I'm sure you did your best then the uh, reverend carlos uh Keanu, i think kijano 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 somewhere in ohio anyway thank you carlos i, I greatly enjoyed uh, the photo walk this week. I especially liked it when halfway through the podcast you asked us to stop, look, and just take a picture. Took me by surprise, but it worked. I felt all giddy after. Wow, that's uh, <laughs> that was some effect. Usually when I go for my photo walks, I take a picture of the first thing I see when I arrive at the trailhead. Well, we kind of did that today, and I always feel like that. If I'm even out on a professional job, I just want to make that first click. It's really important to me. Um, now that's easy to do when you're doing reportage, but if you're doing sort of formal, formal pictures, well, I suppose you could turn, if you're doing formal portraits, I don't know, of a board or something, then, um, board members, then yeah, just get a picture of the building. But I, I like to start with something. I have to start with something and then I'm comfortable to, then, then I feel like I'm, I'm ready to crack on. So I know what you mean. Um, usually when I go for my photo walks, uh, the first thing I, I, I do is take a picture of, of that thing that I see when I arrive at the trailhead. It's rarely, though, the best picture of the walk. Sometimes it's pretty bad, downright awful, but it's always a start of an exploration. So here it is, what I saw when I got out of my car to start the walk, and then 26 minutes, 45 seconds later, into the walk, when you asked us to take a picture. 
See, now, usually I, I only post one picture in the first thing that you see feature, which is on the show page, which is linked to in your show notes today. But, um, but I think this works. I, I'm, I'm going to post the two here on this occasion only. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post Reverend Carlos's first picture that he took when he got out the car. That I'm going to call it the settler, the settler picture. And, um, and then the one that was asked, followed by the one that we asked 26 minutes and 45 seconds later. That sounds right, doesn't it? Let's do that. Here's one from John Sinjin. Hello, Neil. Reference uh, episode 185, Born Free, Photograph Free, Living Free, with uh, photographer George Logan. Another great interview. I was shocked listening to the information being presented and uh, embarrassed I, I didn't know about certain aspects. My, uh, my email, though, is to put forward an ex-British conflict photographer called Jason P. Howe. He encompasses a, a few of your podcasts all into one, really. Conflict images, mental breakdown, animal poaching... The latter I only saw on his Instagram feed. You'll need to scroll to the start. He uh, seemed to use his conflict knowledge to be embedded with anti-poaching troops in Africa for a short while. Wow. That is, I mean, that's risky work, but, but also... Ow. Thistles. Ah. <laughs> Ouch. Um, where was I? Yes. Um, but yeah, that, 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 I mean, that's risky work, but, but equally, how rewarding is that? Um, he's a guy I think you'd like to to have an interview with, maybe a, a YouTube film, though I'm not sure how talkative he is. There's a documentary on him called A Good Day to Die. Well, I did watch a bit of it, and he is talkative, um, you know, with the right questions and talking about the right subjects, yes. It covers his conflict photography and his subsequent mental health. Thank you for for your amazing efforts over this past year especially. Best regards, John Sinjin. Um, so, yes, I've I've written to him. Your suggestion was <laughs> trying to duck away for the thistles on the floor just around this path here. There we go. Um, and uh, I think he'll make a super guest. I, I do hope he says yes. And also, actually, since you mentioned George Logan from episode 185, he was talking about um, the lions in Africa in particular, wasn't he? And the poaching and, and the sad demise of, of lions in Africa. Um, he was a fascinating guest, an amazing photographer, conservationist. And even with his commercial work, he, he draws the conservation. And you have to listen to the whole episode to understand why. But uh, let me play a bit of George Logan, and uh, I'll link to the, the full episode as well today. It's a ridiculous figure. You know, the one that I always say is that there's probably more people in the street that you live or in your neighborhood than there are lions in the world. The numbers are plummeting. Uh, at the current rate of decline, they will be gone from the wild by 2050. Unbelievable. Um, yeah, and um, I think the number goes, you know, I know statistics can be a bit hard to, you know, there are statistics for everything, but in the early 1900s, they reckon there were half a million lions and we're down to 20,000 now. So that trajectory is straight to extinction and it just is going under the radar. I mean, there are lots of species in danger there are lots of other crises in the world. So it's hard for people to, because when I tell people it, no one knows about it either. And uh, it, it's just something that I'm so passionate about that I felt like whatever I can do, we must do that now. Habitat losses and human wildlife conflict kind of go hand in hand because the, the lions now only occupy, I think it's less than 5% of their original historical habitats mm. and when you look in the yeah, yeah, map where the lions used to be they used to be all over north africa ethiopia uh, there, there are now there are now just five areas where there are solid populations left you know, all the, there are a lot of fragmented groups which live in maybe south sudan or ethiopia but you're talking in the low hundreds so that is the biggest issue mm. and as i say every time i go i will see another village all sprung up it's pretty yeah. pretty grim it's the friday photo walk me and my microphone us and our cameras just making some pictures spending some time together that's the idea of this this particular podcast i think i i, I used to say stop saying it didn't i but uh, it's the only photo walk podcast of its type in the podcast sphere i'm not sure that's absolutely true but maybe of its kind maybe of its style uh george logan there it was a 
it was a, a, a conversation that really got me thinking of the, the work of conservationist photographers and how important that is and the fact that uh, for many it's, uh, it's something they have to, to fund themselves um, hoping that uh, an agency or, or a gallery or a newspaper will take up the story and, and co-fund it. We've, uh, we've talked a bit about this of late, haven't we? And of course, um, on Wednesday on the, uh, on the show, we had, uh, we had Tom Stoddart on and he was talking about how, how hard it is to, to fund um, these really, really important photojournalist missions, if you will. Here's one from uh, Mark South from the beautiful south coast town of, well, he can tell you. Hello, Neil, I live in Brighton and I enjoy photography around my day job where I can, a mixture of landscapes and portraits predominantly in the of the living history groups I'm a member of. It's been difficult not being able to get out to the big public events that we used to run, educating and putting on a show for everyone. They're always great fun and big social events for all of us. I haven't really haven't been out much since... Um, Christmas 2020, staying indoors really as much as possible and so found myself doing very little photography due to poor mental health. Thankfully now now lifting as the, the lockdown does. Oh, I'm pleased to hear it. But uh, through all that, Photography Daily Podcast, you and your guests have been regular companions to my day and have kept me feeling engaged with photography while being wonderfully informative and reassuring when I'm not being able to pick up the camera myself. So thank you and to and to your guests too. It's about time I joined in on Patreon, and which you did. I saw I saw your name pop up. So my sincere thanks for for supporting the show. Very appreciative of that. I genuinely am. He sent some pictures in, which I, which I will share in the show notes. And it's a tremendous story that he's that he's sent in. I'll read his his words. This first photo attached here is uh, the most recent landscape photo I've shot taken on Christmas Eve 2020 while on a walk with a very good friend of mine up to the Shatry War Memorial which is just outside Brighton and uh, the picture that you see that you'll see in the show notes um, is um, well it's it's um, it, it's a widescape isn't it it's not quite a panoramic but it's uh, it's on the way isn't it and uh, it looks out towards the sea off the coast of Brighton and you can see well I counted around about 60 I think it's 60 plus and I, I guess on either side, just a little bit more, you'd, you'd probably easily, easily find the 100. But there's, I didn't realise there were so many wind farms, um, wind turbines, wind farms, wind turbines out there. Yeah, an uh, incredible picture, fantastic. So that, that's what he opens up with. And then he goes on to say, as we're both very much into the history of the First World War and some of the less represented groups that were present, it's an important place for us. Shatri is a memorial specifically to the, the Indian soldiers killed fighting in the First World War and stands on the site and the granite foundation slabs of the funeral pyres where the bodies of some of the Hindu and Sikh soldiers' bodies were cremated, having been brought back from the, from the front to hospitals set up inside the Royal Pavilion, the Dome or the Corn Exchange, which are all very famous buildings, of course, in, in Brighton. And then they sadly passed, so that, that was where they were taken next. The memorial fell into disrepair in the 1930s and bears the marks of where it's been shot at. No, really? Although whether it was shot at by Commonwealth soldiers prior to the Second World War, the land around was used by army for training. Ah, ah, you see. So, uh, yeah, OK, that makes a bit more sense. Or by Luftwaffe planes emptying their ammo before heading back over the channel during the Second World War. That's in some debate, so obviously there's been some historical uh, work done on this. The first photograph was shot from just next to the memorial, looking back toward Brighton and out to the Rampion Wind Farm, as we've mentioned, on the, uh, on the horizon as the, the sun was setting. I've also included some shots I took of the memorial back in 2018 during the centenary of the armistice, showing where it sits in the, the landscape and some of the impact marks. If you'd like to know more about Shatry, well, i tell you what, he's, um, he's included a link, which is, um, which is really interesting. So I'll put the link on the, on the page, on the show page today. And of course... Uh, also, we'll, uh, we'll share those pictures that uh, were made by, by Mark, Mark South. Um, so you can see those, those pictures that we're referencing. And uh, I'll link to his website as well, because there's some fantastic work on the website. I don't really understand, never really understood, why, why people don't like wind farms. There's a lot of sort of um, debate over wind farms. I've always thought they, it's a really good sustainable way to gather energy. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm quite romantic about 
the, 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 windmill, the wonderful windmills you find either on the, the east coast of England, in uh, Norfolk and Suffolk in particular, across the fens, and uh, then, of course, in, in, in Holland, those beautiful windmills that you find in, in Holland. So I, I, know, I, know, I know these don't look quite as romantic as those buildings, those structures, but, uh, but the, the wind farms that we have, I, don't, I quite like seeing them. Yeah, I always feel a bit peaceful watching them go round and round and round and round. I don't have any problem at all. It's sort of this nimbyism of, oh, I don't want those there. Really, that, they're spoiling my view. Doris, I don't like those. Why do they have to be there? It's a blot on the landscape. Saving the planet, my backside. As he throws his polystyrene fish and chips tray across the sand. It's all right, Doris, it'll break down at sea. Everybody knows that. Ugh. Don't get me started. Anyway, shall we, um, I tell you what, it'd be nice to play some inspiration from, um, we've mentioned him already, of course, and uh, Tom Stoddart on Wednesday. Fabulous um, to talk to Tom again about his book, Extraordinary Women, Courage, Endurance and Defiance. And uh, there was a particular part in the episode where he mentioned the late and very great, very well-respected um, journalist Marie Colvin, who lost her life, of course, in, in Homs, wasn't it? She lost her life. And um, he, he mentioned working with Marie in the very early days of her career and uh, a rather ingenious method they found for getting film out of a, a combat zone in case they were stopped. It seems that these might have been days where, where even troops stopping you would have had some dignity. Um, I think things are slightly different now, aren't they? The, uh, the, the engagement rules have rather changed. But in those days, this was, a, this was the ingenious method that Tom, helped ably by Marie, uh, found when they wanted to smuggle out some pictures. Well, it was um, 1987. Um, Marie and I were, you know, two young freelancers working for the Sunday Times. We were in Beirut. We were trying to get access to a, a camp where many Palestinian people were being surrounded by Amal militia, who were a Syrian-backed militia. The, there were rumors coming out of the um, refugee camp that people were being killed and shot, being starved to death. And um, we wanted to get in to find out what the truth was. Eventually, Marie and I managed to bribe a commander to effectively give us one minute to run across no man's land. And for that one minute, his men wouldn't shoot us. So we, um, we literally held hands and ran. Of course, we, we weren't able to tell the Palestinian fighters that we were coming. After 24 hours, we, we did the reverse run and Marie was carrying my film in her underwear because we figured if we got out that there was less chance of her being searched than me. And we were also carrying a letter for the Queen from Pauline Cutting to basically say, can you help us? So we did the reverse run and then we, we got straight back to London and the Sunday Times ran the piece on page one and inside. Robin Morgans was instrumental in getting that on page one. And it's still the most important set of pictures that I've ever shot because within a few days, the Syrian regime lifted the siege and, and many lives were saved. So it's bittersweet really because this was the first time that Marie had been in this kind of situation and she became captivated by this kind of story where she could make, where her words would make a, a real difference. The in incredible, as I say, but perfectly well mean, Tom Stoddart, episode 238, talking about extraordinary women, which we... Um, we talked about as well, actually, on the, on the book club. Um, I'll talk about Patreon in a minute because uh, book club is part of our Thursday Patreon show. And uh, but I, before I do that, I've seen these trees just on the the horizon, and I, I really like it when you can get a when you can subtract as much as you can from a photograph, and you're left with one sometimes quite small vista detail. It's a brace of trees, possibly three. No, a brace. So the correct phrase for two trees. Um, but I like it because it's sat right on, the, right on the horizon. And I think I can isolate those trees really nicely. 500th, I seem to be at 500th today. Oh, I need a bit more actually, thousandth, it's got quite bright. There we go. If, uh, 
f5 6 and uh, nicely focused up there we go another one always two nil do you not trust your first yeah maybe so yeah this week's book club which would have been yesterday for the patrons uh, was tim rudman's oh just phenomenal book iceland an uneasy calm and i had a few things to say about that i remember when england um topical euro 2020 gag here uh, were beaten by Iceland in the in the last Euro football competition. The commentator said, beaten by a team that has more volcanoes than professional football players. How we all groaned. 2020 nil, aren't we in 2021? Just in case you haven't caught up with a... Well, you're not necessarily a, a soccer or football follower, I understand. But uh, the competition was, of course, supposed to be last year. All well, the European te teams play each other, those that uh, get through anyway. But uh, that didn't happen. So they, they kept the title and just moved it by a year. So it's still Euro 2020, even though we're in 2021. But uh, I guess uh, <laughs> I guess they must have printed a lot of merchandise. But uh, while we're on the subject of, uh, of patrons, thank you very much for your support. If you're a patron and you support this show, you really do help us in no small measure because it's my intention to keep building this, this community. And the idea really is that we... Uh, well, I want to keep growing this podcast, keep growing the communities. There are, and there will always be, um, free levels of that. And I think it's important that there are as well. Um, but equally, those that uh, join in with uh, our Patreon, I like to feel we, we do our bit or I do my bit. And uh, I make a book club every single Thursday and also a, a diary, some personal diary, some personal thoughts. Uh, usually about photography, but uh, not always, as you all know. And the idea is uh, over the coming months as well, I want, to, I want to share sort of gems, if you like, websites that I find and, and uh, things that start uh, conversations. So uh, that'll be over in, in our Patreon channel, which, which uh, you're very welcome to come and join us for the, for the princely sum of just £3 a month, plus sales tax, blah, blah, blah. Where were we? Oh yes, Iceland. Well, not quite Iceland, but that sort of neck of the woods, uh, sort of, if you squint at the map and turn very quickly. Uh, Dennis Skyam, good friend of the show, as you know, in Denmarkland, as we now know it. Hello there, there, Neil. Another week, another walk with you and my ears. This time, however, I left the relative safety of civilised Copenhagen and uh, headed to the, the barbarian provinces of Jutland, more specifically the western coast trademark of the coast is their fishing villages with the iconic fishing boats on the beach so of course I had to go there uh, to calm my nerves from being away from the city I had to have a Belgian waffle with ice cream and cookies for medicinal purposes obviously yes best regards or Venlik Hilsen from uh, Dennis Skyam these are beautiful pictures that you've sent what is it about do you know I've, I'm being followed by uh, I'm sure I, I've got like a festoon of flies above my head. These are the summer flies, aren't they? I've put on some, um, some sunscreen. I think they obviously like the coconut smell. Go away! Stop it! Anyway, Dennis Skyam, these are beautiful pictures. All your work is. I love the Banksy-style picture of the child stencil peering around the corner with, uh, with oncoming walkers. As always, the pictures will be on the show page. I spotted the Belgian waffle too, which is, um, which is not half measures, is it? Oreos, waffles, ice cream. That looks like a good sort of toffee or caramel sauce. It's practically a health warning and a dish, isn't it? But I, oh, I tell you what, I bet that tasted good. There'll be a picture of that on the show page as well. Here's one from uh, Josephine Rudd. Hello, Neil. First time writer, but feel compelled to get in touch after hearing episode 232. Melissa Roth talking about photographing her spiritual home. Of, uh, of Tibet. I have to say she talks with such passion and sincerity that uh, I actually felt I was there with her. This is one of those bucket list places, or so I believed. She opened my eyes too to what uh, this place seems to become in terms of how authorities have hijacked the spiritual nature to use it for a, an agenda of kind of theme park style tourism. An incredible story of making a book and following your intuition as a photographer though, it inspired me at any rate. Full of, as we Aussies say, takeaways. <laughs> Josephine Rudd, part-time surfer, part-time caterer, full-time mum, an extra-time lover of photography. Brilliant. 
Wonderful. Let's play something. Should we? Should we play something from two three two? Thank you for for your email, Josephine. If you'd like to send in an email to the show, it's nice and easy. Do what Josephine did and send it to studio at photographydaily.show. Or you can go via uh, a DM through our Facebook group if you haven't uh, joined our Facebook group. And of course, patrons, well, they have direct access. And it's, uh, it's great to have the conversations that we do through Patreon. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's have something from 232. Shooting your big life-changing photo project. This is Marissa Roth. I mean, I tell people, I know they find it shocking, but I tell people I could have died in Tibet and been very happy to finish my life at that point. Mm. Wow. And I can't explain it. I mean, it was so powerful. But I felt like it was all very familiar. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, it was, I, I felt... It was like the happiest I've ever been. It was the most content I've ever been. I felt like I was home in a way. Mm. I mean, I had an amazing experience at the, one of the nunneries in Lhasa. I had been there on the first trip, but I wanted to go back a second trip because my I, I went with a woman friend and I wanted her to experience it. And it was a much less sort of planned out trip. The second, the first trip, we were just like going, going, going over land and constant motion. And the second trip, I said, I just want to base ourselves in Lhasa and kind of just go at the pace that feels comfortable, do what we want to do. So we, we went to the nunnery. And then at one point, we sat with the nuns who were rolling prayers to be inserted into little handheld prayer wheels. And then we went back a second time in the afternoon when they were in prayer. So their prayer sanctuary is fairly small. And I was sitting sort of on a back bench and one of the nuns beckoned me to sit next to her on the bench, the prayer bench, uh, in between two nuns. And I thought, oh my God, this is a really auspicious, you know, experience. I mean, I was really honored. And I sat down on the seat and it was like, I thought, oh, this is my seat. It was that kind of almost metaphysical experience. I mean, it was like, okay. Marissa Roth talking about uh, her time in Tibet. It's a pleasure talking to Marissa. I'm actually hoping, 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 hoping to meet up with her very soon in person. In person? Ah, oh, really? Yes, I know those days are returning. Hello, Neil. I'm a, a fan of the show uh, and a recent Patreon supporter. Who's this from? Frank Woodward. Yes, yeah, sorry, Frank. I should have started with your name. Um, I really want to say I appreciate the, uh, the podcast, excellent production value and uh, attention to detail. Well, you're most kind. I shall say shucks in a moment. Most importantly, a sincere connection with your audience that comes through in your work. Well, that's good. If that's how you feel, that's, uh, that's certainly music to my ears, Frank. I've been a photography enthusiast for several years, and it really brings me joy. I enjoy landscape and night sky photography, but I'm most serious about birds and wildlife. I'm fortunate to live in a state where outdoor adventure opportunities abound. I maintain a, a small website with selected landscape and wildlife images at woodwoodphotos.com. And I'll link to that. I'll make sure there's a link on today's show page so people can go and appreciate that. But I'm most serious about uh, birds and wildlife. But as, uh, as the time goes on, I've started to appreciate the value in printing my work rather than just sharing online. I like to think a print is how a photo prefers to live on. Thanks again, and please uh, know that your time and your effort are much appreciated. Look look at this scene, by the way, that I've just walked into. So it's, a, it's a nice sort of English, ju just, um, just bailed scene. Let me get a picture of it. Uh, what am I going to do? Drop my shutter speed a bit because it's uh, you know, some clouds have just come over. Where should we go? 250th? Yeah, 250th. I said 200. And where are we at? F8. Eight. Yeah, F8. Here we go. There we go. Two. <laughs> Got to do two. But uh, Frank Woodward, thank you. In Tennessee, USA. I've included a link to Frank's work. I'm just blown away by the the, uh, the bird photography. The birds hovering in flight. Are they? Oh, look, Frank, I'm really going to show that my knowledge is, is lacking here. Are they hummingbirds? That's what they look like to me. But they're just stunning pictures. I mean, these are 
These are magazine winners every single time, and I genuinely mean that. And this is a hobby which you put your you put your heart and soul into. I can I can tell. So uh, please go. Uh, I always think that uh, with the show notes with this particular program, you can't do it if you're out listening now, which is the way I like to think. People, are. not always, I know, but it's nice if you're out listening to the photo walk with your earbuds on and we're making some pictures together that that's the that's the design of this podcast if you like but uh, when you get back brew up or uh, make yourself a coffee whatever you do and uh, take a moment uh, to look through the links that i leave on the show page and uh, frank's is on there and you'll you'll love his work right last mail of the week time hello neil this one is from richard yarp who is in um, the Woodlands, Texas. I think uh, the farmer's just arrived into this field. I don't think he's going to be bailing. I might have to to bail and finish the last mail of the week in a different location. I'm rather being attacked by these flies overhead again. Oh, get off. Ow, did you just bite me? No, it's all right. He's turned left. It's okay. We can do this email. Hello, Neil. I have my earbuds in listening to your uh, photo walk episode while I was out taking photos around my my town on an overcast afternoon. I can't completely claim it was a pure photo walk because I did move around by car to get to a few places that are far apart. I was uh, using my recently acquired X-T3 that I bought from, uh, used from MPB. Oh, flying the flag. Thank you, Richard. After hearing about them on the show, I've been a, a Nikon, Nikon, Nikon shooter for many years, most recently with a D, D750. But like many of the Fuji converts I hear about, uh, after I got an X100F, I was captivated. I tell you what, if you like the X100F, wait till you get the X100V. Last month, I sold all the, the Nikon gear, Nikon gear to MPB. It could not have gone smoother. Glad to hear it. I've attached a few of the keepers from my outing when I was around to... Uh, Lake Woodlands, which is a a large man-made lake in our town. The town is a northern suburb of Houston. Yeah, the pictures are are fabulous, obviously. Richard, thank you for those. And I'll put those uh, those pictures and links on the show page today. We've talked a lot about uh, landscapes today. I feel we have. Have we talked a lot about landscapes? No, we talked about urbex. Talked about Tibet. I think we talked about landscapes. I'm going to bring back, uh, for the last bit of inspiration for this photo walk today... Our good friend, Barry Butler, from episode 226, Landscape Journalism, Chicago. Barry uh, makes pictures, uh, well, pretty much every morning as the sun rises and every evening as the sun goes down, accompanied by his, uh, by his dogs. And, uh, and, and he was a fascinating guest to talk to about how he shoots landscape and why he shoots landscape and, and what he feels about it. And the fact that actually he, he does call it landscape journalism and not necessarily um, landscape photography. Barry Butler. I rarely uh, took shots seriously in Chicago. No. I was, um, you know, I would be shooting in Ireland or I would go to the, to the national parks here in the United States or some of the scenic coastal areas in the United States. That's where I would be doing my photography. And, and I think anyone would understand this, that, you know, if you're not uh, photographing on a daily basis and let's say you've taken a few weeks off or a couple of months off and then you decide to go somewhere you're fumbling with your equipment you're like okay oh wait I can't believe I forgot that or you know just the simple things like you, you get into rhythms and um, I felt that many times that um, uh, I was going out on trips so I said to myself you know what why don't I like treat um, shooting around Chicago as my uh, my pregame? You know, my preparing for a game, and uh, you know, but no one's going to care about these shots. Who cares about buildings? Who cares about uh, you know the the city look? So I would take the shots and think nothing of it. And this was just at the start of social media um, when it started to get hot. What year are we in? We're in 2021, so whether it was 2007, 2008, when it started to really get hmm. rolling. And I would put my Chicago shots up there and just say, hey, I was out at Fullerton Avenue Beach today, and uh, I'm gonna check this out. And people are like, wow, I really like that. I'm like, oh, um, I'm going to Yosemite tomorrow. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some shots then. And they're like, no, I really like that. And so. Um, I had a friend who was really kind of kicking me in the rear end and saying, you know, you should really do more of the Chicago stuff because you're showing stuff that people don't see. 
and I'm like, okay. Um, and then as I was doing this more often, I was starting to fall in love photographically with the city. And um, the rest is history because then I kept on posting on social media and it just turned into a snowball. And so this was not like some great business plan no. that came about. It evolved organically. Great to hear again from Barry Butler. I'll be sure to include links to all the inspirational guests you have heard today. Marissa Roth, Barry Butler, Tom Stoddart and George Logan. And that's almost it for this week, bar the fact that I want to give you a a proper heads up, actually, and play you just a a smidge of an interview to come. It's coming up on Wednesday, actually, with Ryan Visions, who I've been meaning to talk to for quite some time about his wanderlust, and more specifically, van life with a camera. We've talked so much about being on the road in various episodes, but I've never actually chatted about the the solitude of a, a life that, on the face of it, sounds, well, pretty perfect. Travelling in a van with all the cameras you need, just making a book about your mission to make pictures in every single American state. What's not to like? But it turns out, Ryan's mission to make pictures is a very personal one too. And he's very candid about it on Wednesday. So I I do have my dog with me. His name is Freedom. He is a rescue dog that I I rescued in Puerto Rico during Hurricane Maria. Uh, He was super small. He was like two weeks old when I found him. And he's my best friend. And he's on this road trip with me. And a lot of my photography project has to be focused around him because I don't want to leave him anywhere. And he's my best friend. And I just can't. You know, there's certain things I can't do. But as as far as the isolation thing goes, you know, I think generally I, I deal with it sometimes. I deal with that loneliness and I'm forced to deal with it. Uh, but I also have a lot of previous experience in preparation for it. You know, before I got on the before I got on the road, there was a lot of things that I had to decide about myself to prepare myself to do this because I knew it was going to be mentally straining and uh, potentially dangerous to my mental health. And I was dealing, like I mentioned before, with traumas. So, you know, before the pandemic started, about six months before the pandemic started, I started going to trauma therapy and, and started getting sober. And my dog was there the whole time. And so that was really important for me to bring him along because there was times where I wouldn't leave my house or leave my bed even for days at a time. And he would lay with me and be there through my hardest times. And so when I got on the road for the adventure of the lifetime, I said, I can't get rid of this guy. He's got to come. He was there from there my worst, man. <laughs> and so, you know, I want to give him the best life. And so, you know, a lot of this, I tell people, you know, yeah, I'm making a photography book, but really it's just an excuse to give my dog the best life I can. <laughs> Quite literally, in this case, man's best friend, There's more in that story about the logistics of being on the road with everything you own, including where you store your kit, the plan, the weather, the fact that this is Van 2. Find out what happened one day to the original Van 1 that he set out in on Wednesday when we chat. So keep sending your questions, your thoughts about photography, what you do, any ideas that you may have that you think may inspire others, or feedback to studio at photographydaily.show so that I can feature you in the mailbag edition, which is this Friday Photo Walk. Thanks to MPB.com, the number one team when it comes to buying used, selling your used, or trading in Europe, the UK, and the States. Music in the show today from artlist.io. For me, they bring the texture and professional flavour to this. So if you make films, slideshows and podcasts, you can, like we do, subscribe to their service. And if you do that from the menu on our website, photographydaily.show, just along the top there, they send us a little love in return. I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. Oh, car? You? I seem to have picked up a few flies. Don't you dare go bringing them into my cockpit. I know these are horrible. Look at them. They're sort of swarming over me. you like a magnet. Very funny. It's not very funny. It's very embarrassing, actually. It happens quite a lot to me when... I think it's pheromones. Is it pheromones? There we go. Followed by flies. That means that man's got lots of pheromones. He's an animal. You certainly an animal. Don't be rude. No, just don't bring the flies back. I don't know. When during the winter you moan about the mud I bring back, during the summer about the flies. Can't do right for doing wrong. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.